This is the Jeff Santos Show. MTC on the air. His latest edition. It is always great to end the uh, week with uh, a little new music. Courtesy of the independent artist. No need for any license to play a little MTC. It is time to go to Seattle, WA, and talk to our good friend, the Renaissance man, the great musician, the great journalist, Democracy Watch News, and of course, every Friday now on the Jeff Santo Show, talk to Mark Taylor Canfield, MTC. How are you, sir? Oh, I'm doing okay, Jeff. And thanks for playing this song. Yeah, that's a uh, pre-release. I gave you guys exclusive right to do that. So you're the only people who are allowed to play that song right now. Awesome. And thank you, thank you. You can soon to be released on TikTok and Spotify and all of the big major distributors. That's how all the musicians are making our money these days is you know streaming music online. So, But you, people can check out my music at SoundCloud. I am up there, and you can... Listen to my tracks for free there. I'm also at Reverb Nation, and then a lot of my stuff is at YouTube. So a lot of times what I'll do is I'll take those songs, and that's what we'll do with this one is we take the songs, and then we make a music video out of it, and then we usually post that up at YouTube for free just as a promotional, you know, for the song to get people to go check out and download the song. But, um, Jeff, I was going to tell you, I'm sitting here in Seattle, and, man, once again, you cannot trust the weather forecast around here. So according to the National Weather Service... And our local media, there should be rain and heavy winds with gusts up to 25 miles an hour right now, which is why I didn't uh, go out on the boat today. And uh, you know what? I'm looking out the window. It's completely calm. There's no rain at all. It looks great. So I, I don't know whether it's just this time of year, but beware. Never trust the weather forecast in Seattle. Always just dress in layers and expect the unexpected. Because yesterday, once again, they were saying it was supposed to be a, a miserable day. And, Jeff, I was out there. There were two rainbows. All the birds, the blue herons were flying around. It was a beautiful, beautiful sunset. No rain. Totally calm. No wind. So don't trust it. Just look out the window, guys. Um, that would be my suggestion to the weather forecasters. And occasionally, <laughs> you might want to look yeah. out the window. Yeah, look out the window before you read the computer. <laughs> It's sort of like the baseball analytics guys, you know. You can't uh, judge if you don't scout the the player. You just can't look at the. Uh, uh, you can't just look at the computer screen. Uh, no, I, I think you're you're spot on, man. Too many people looking at computer screens and not enough reality. Well, the, it's like reviewing a movie without ever having seen the movie. And I I know a particular magazine in this town who got accused of doing that when Woody Harrelson and. Uh, Shirley Theron and that gang did uh, the Battle in Seattle movie. Uh, there was a particular uh, local magazine here who panned it, and when I approached the, the promoters and the, ma- the filmmakers and the actors and actresses, they said, well, since we never gave anybody a copy of the film and we were going to exclusive, you know, to have its premiere in Seattle, the New Seattle Inter- International Film Festival, we have no idea how anybody could have actually seen the final cut, so I would just kind of ignore that review. <laughs> and by the way, <laughs> they panned, it, this magazine also panned, Okay, I'll say it. It was the Stranger magazine. And, no, you know, there are some good people at Stranger. I'm not saying it's, it's a bad magazine. They actually do some good journalism. But at this particular time, they had a reporter who, for some reason, had a chip on their shoulder against the makers of that film, uh, including Stuart Townsend, who was actually the director as well as one of the actors, and he is from Queen of the Damned, you know. But uh, they panned the film. The, the reporter showed up at the press briefing and started an argument 
with the actors and actresses and told Shirley's there that they were just disappointed that an Academy Award winning actress would go on to do such meaningless movies and, you know, and spend her time trying to help save sea turtles, you know, instead of doing, you know, grade A movies or something. And basically that was a slap in the face. And then Suzanne Cunningham asked me, and she was with Survivor, but she's also in that movie. She said, you know, where does, do you know where that person lives? <laughs> I'm like, yeah. why? Hey, I'm I... Like, oh, I, I, I think you're right on right on there with the stranger. Um, let me ask you some good news though that's coming out of uh, your city yeah. uh, in terms of some local music venues. Uh, talk to me about uh, uh, Crocodile and, uh, and and Dave Garfield Wilson's uh, Rebar. Yeah, really good news. Um, two of the major players in the Seattle music scene for years, the Rebar, which is yeah you know owned by my friend Dane Garfield Wilson. Uh, very well known for alternative theater as well as alternative music in that establishment for 30 years. Uh, this last year they celebrated their 30 year anniversary. Well, they had announced that they weren't going to open up in the Denny Triangle, which is this triangle sort of block area at the foot of Capitol Hill in Seattle, uh, right by I 5 there. And, you know, so everybody was really disappointed. And then, but I, you know, he kept telling me. Don't worry, there will be a rebar too. There will be a, a rebar this sequel. We're not done yet. And so what we found out is that actually they do plan to reopen the rebar, but in another location in the city. The same with the crocodile. And we had talked about Peter Buck and R.E.M. and their connection with crocodile. They've also played there. Also Pearl Jam and the Nirvana played there. The crocodile is one of the best places you can ever see music in Seattle because it had this great uh, big stage, but... Uh, festival seating and stuff so people would just walk right up to the stage if you got in there and early enough and got in the front row you could see your favorite musician right in front of you it was amazing and they also have announced that even though if you walk by the where the building is now it's all boarded up um and this that just happened within the last couple of weeks they've actually announced that they're going to reopen in a new location here's the takeaway from all this jeff the music is moving south it's moving to south seattle which like Columbia City, Rainier Valley, and they are going to be surrounded by other great clubs that are already there, like the Columbia City Theater, like the Hummingbird and the Rumba Notes, where I love to perform. Um, Shana Shepard from Barracks had her own night at the Hummingbird, which would invite you know musicians to come and perform with her. Just really great times there with her. And the Royal Room, which is one of the best places to play in Seattle. It's got one of the best reputations. That's in South Seattle. So it's looking like all the good stuff is moving south. It's moving down to where traditionally there are a lot of really great, great black music clubs and the Blue Note and places where Ray Charles would perform and a lot of great black musicians. So, hey, I think we're going back to our roots, actually, and a lot of um, the venues are moving south, of course. Why? Because they can't afford the rents. Um, even though both of these places have received some government funding, um, there has been some assistance from state, county, and even the national government on this kind of stuff that they were able to survive as a business even though they were closed. But they got turned down either by the new developers of the area, which would be the the crocodile where they wanted to buy the building and the owner said no they just no because they want to raise the entire block wipe out about five or six traditional um good you know seattle style bars in the area like shorties which fortunately was able to move one block north and survive but uh the the lava lounge and uh the rabbit hole at a lot of other places and, and a famous jazz club there called tulas have all been closing down, not only because of the COVID um, thing, but also because the developers came along and there was a big fight. You know, I was at some of those meetings at the Landmark Preservation Board and stuff where people were trying to get the the building uh, preserved as a landmark status. Um, they were not completely successful. The developers are just going to take that whole block. So it's called mass development. It's where you don't just take down part of uh, the block or one or two buildings, you just knock them all down. And the crocodile is right there in that same area. So unfortunately, Belltown, which was always the place where a lot of people would come to when they visited Seattle to check out the cool clubs and bars, it's, you know, having trouble. Now, one of my favorite places also to play there is called the Belltown Yacht Club, which I think is hilarious. It's kind of a take on, <laughs> on the yacht clubs here in Seattle and, uh, where people have their multi-million dollar boats, but, 
Um, it's actually a smaller rock venue um, in the back of a bar called The Screwdriver, underneath the Belltown Pub. So it's a series of pubs right there in that one block. And I sure hope it survives, Jeff, because it is really what truly makes Seattle special. Um, it's the small clubs, the the places where you, you as a band get your start. Seattle's a great place to get your start as a musician because there are a lot of small bars and clubs right. that are always looking for music. Well, let, let me ask you this, uh, Mark, because I think it's really important uh, that uh, people understand um, this and how it connects to music. You know, we talk a lot about small businesses, uh, you know, some like Aspiration.com. Again, if you want to find out more, go to Aspiration.com forward slash revolution, sponsor of the Jeff Santo Show. There are small businesses that are in, you know, the banking world or they're in... Uh, uh, retail, whatever the case may be, uh, restaurants. I'm wondering, you know, in the case of uh, music venues, if people understand that these small, um, you know, venues are are creating art. Uh, they they are also are creating a place where people can go to unwind. So there's a psychological advantage to all of this. It's also you know uh, people that's how they make a living. They they you know they bring in bands. They have to pay the bands, uh, and you know they they have a small five dollars or ten dollars to get into the building. Um, and of course you, you know you have your price of drinks and whatever other you know small bar food that you have. And I, I think that they should be getting help from the federal government. I know that I think you had said in, in uh, your email to me that uh, that they did get some federal government uh, help. Is, is this something that is new, um, you know, during this pandemic or have they been getting help in the past in, in Seattle? No, this is because of some relief funds that have been set up um, due to COVID. So small right. businesses have the the, the paycheck, um, you know, Security Protection Act, right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that really helps the crocodile because they've been closed, so they're not making any money at all. In fact, Dane's Club, the rebar, was costing them $10,000 a month just to, you know, keep the overhead and the rent of the building and the leasing the building. So they that's why some clubs have actually closed temporarily and actually left the original location. So you walk by and you see them boarded up and you're thinking, oh, this is the end of the music scene in Seattle. But in reality, what they're doing is they're moving to newer parts of the, uh, or uh, new areas that are going to become even more lively in terms of culture. And then, you know, you'll, you'll probably see this, this similar cycle we've seen all the all throughout history in Seattle and Los Angeles and other places I've been where you have uh, the artists and the really cool art clubs and rock uh, venues and art galleries moving into parts under more underdeveloped parts of the city or older parts of the city that are more affordable, like Georgetown and Seattle is another example of that. And then eventually <laughs> the real estate developers come there too and start knocking everything down and putting up condos. But it gives people a place to go for a while before it sort of gets on the radar again. But I think it's really going to enliven um, South Seattle and hopefully, Jeff, it will create a precedent here in this community. Because, you know, we've been fighting this battle to save the show box, too. Um, and, and we lost El Corazon, which is where my band, The Galaxy Machine, had our recording studio for years and rehearsal space for years. That's where I met David Johansson and the New York Dolls. And had some amazing, wonderful times there. Saw some historic shows. Saw Keith Emerson stabbing his B3 Hammond with a knife, you know, during a solo show. There. Crazy stuff like that. But... I hope that the city will realize and the community will realize that we need to continue to have public funding for the arts, not just the Benaray Hall, the Sim Seattle Symphony Hall, and the opera, and the major players in, in the uh, donation world. I mean, they already get millions of dollars every year from their private donors. I'm talking about the smaller arts organizations and small music venues. There's always been a struggle. There was even something... Uh, a whole movement that was created here at one time uh, that was pushing back against some of the um, liquor and dance laws, which made it hard for clubs to have all ages shows. So there has been a lot of movements that even musicians like um, Chris Novoselic from Nirvana got involved with to try to push the city, you know, to give more support for 
the, these kinds of venues in the in the city. We want it to be more like Austin, Texas, where it's you know that's why people go there. They go to go to these clubs. They go to hear the bands like New Orleans. You know, there are places in Chicago and Nashville and all over the country where people go just to see the music, and that's the way Seattle has been. And we would just like to see more support from our elected leaders. Now we do have. The Elysian Brewery, which is a local um, pub that does some really great stuff, but they have an IPA called Keep Music Live, and they're helping to partnership with a statewide campaign called Keep Music Live, which is trying to raise money specifically to keep the music scene in Washington State and you know and, and in my city, Seattle, going because it does need we need help. And it's yeah. I mean some of my best memories are going to some of these clubs. It's great. Well, I here. think that it's great, and I, and I remember going to some of mine, whether they're in Boston and Cambridge or uh, when I lived in uh, in, in D.C. and in, in, in New York. Uh, they they are they are really you know for a young person, uh, any person really under the age of sixty, uh, who particularly if they're uh, single without kids. Um, you know, it's 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 great place. People, you know, bond. They listen to their music. Uh, have a couple of IPAs, as you say, uh, and enjoy it. You know, and this is something that we need to not only in Seattle but community as a whole. Uh, you know, we talked to Rabbi Michael Lerner to start out with, and then just recently Joe Sandberg, and the idea of community and taking care of each other and taking care of uh, of neighborhoods is so critical. And if the Democratic Party is going to do that, uh, you know, is going to be the majority party, this is something that they're going to have to really understand. Uh, Bernie Sanders understands. I know Miss Sawant, the great progressive city council, is a Democratic socialist, understands it. But we need more, and and that uh, goes without saying. Speaking of Miss Sawant, I understand that uh, she was not, uh, um, you know, uh, <clears throat> aware of the fact that your mayor, uh, Durkin, who uh, I guess is a lame duck announced and she won't uh, run for election, uh, election uh, coming up next year, I guess, um, you know, uh, apparently arrested 20 people, the S Seattle Police Department, uh, at Cal Anderson Park. Talk to me about that today. Well, yeah, it's confusing to me um, because... My own uh, representative on the city council, Andrew Lewis, um, Robert Reich's protege, he said, you know, he told me that he was not uh, in favor of these kinds of sweeps because there are also encampments in at Denny Park, which is the old, oldest park in Seattle. Um, but for some reason, oh, see, I'm seeing, okay, 10 arrested here. There have been, okay, 21 arrested six hours ago, Seattle Times. Um, so that is the, by the way, that is the traditional, uh, place where CHOP was organized, the Capitol Hill Autonomous, um, zone that everybody was talking about across the country and around the world. And so what's happened is that during this pandemic, so many people have lost, uh, their homes that people are pretty much camping in the parks. It's very much like the Hoovervilles that this country saw in the 1930s during the Great Depression. And so, uh... On Thursday night, um, Mayor Dur well, here's a statement. Mayor Durkin um, made a statement about all this. He said, Mayor Durkin believes our city can have mutually shared values. Individuals experiencing homelessness should be in safer places like shelters and hotels, especially during the winter, and our parks should not be places with illegal and unsafe conduct, like fires, makeshift barricades, blocking access to residents and first responders, or individuals who are threatening city workers conducting routine maintenance and breaking into city facilities. So apparently, you know, uh, she has made a decision to work with the police to do this, um, and they set up, uh, you know, police lines, you know, police tape in the park, and weren't allowing people in. While the the parks department workers are then brought in to dismantle uh, the structures that people have created. So this has been an ongoing thing. It's it's gone. It's happened over and over again. There's actually another encampment here called Nicholsville, which was named after our former mayor Greg Nichols. Um, and it's the same thing. It was named after him because he tended to uh, favor the developers after he got into office. Um, but, you know, this is another ongoing story with, on Capitol Hill where there's a very independent-minded uh, kind of community uh, that likes to think for itself and doesn't always take its lead from the mayor. And then you have a, a sort of uh, more business-oriented mayor um, who is more apt to sweep the parks and, un, you know, and dismantle unsightly uh, tents 
than to actually deal directly with the issue of homelessness in the city. So uh, my experience is um, that when she says, and she said this when CHOP was dismantled, that, well, we're going to send in city workers to make sure that these people um, get a place to live. And in many cases, we didn't see that happen. The police just showed up and arrested people. So I wouldn't call that a proactive way of dealing with economic displacement. And as I've said before, some of these homeless encampments around the country, if they were uh, located on an international border, you know, they would be considered a, an international refugee camp and there would be, you know, assistance from the Red Cross and the UN. But because they're under the bridge and being swept from the city parks across the country, um, I mean, talk about uh, a national issue that isn't addressed and needs to be addressed. It's not just Seattle. It's all across the country. And if the Democrats don't address that issue, then they're not really seriously facing the economic distress that people are, are experiencing every day on a daily basis right now. And that, that has to happen. I know uh, our Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal and other folks like Shama Swan have been trying to address this issue with city funding, with taxing corporations to try to provide housing for people, um, but they, it never seems to be adequate to actually deal with the problem. And, yeah, you know, I, I really should be on the phone with my city council member right now, Andrew Lewis, and asking him what is the city council's response to this since your publicly stated policy during our town hall meeting was that he did not support those kinds of sweeps. First of all, he says people are just going to come back, so it doesn't solve the problem. It doesn't get people a place to live. And I come down on this issue of, you know, poverty uh, is not illegal, folks, and, you know, it should not be a crime to be poor in the United States. And unfortunately, that's a lot of the times that's the way people who have no political clout and have no political well yeah i mean you know the name the last lobbyist for uh you know from mother Teresa or somebody who cares about poverty uh that's that's the case i mean you know, people like reverend barber out there are people the only people out there who are actually talking about it uh you know the, the homeless uh, situation across this country is disgusting and outrageous um and this is why we you know we need to have a tremendous change in government both parties have, have basically ignored them stepped over them in some cases uh, and it's really tragic. And, you know, outside of the, the Bernie, Brigade, Bernie Brigade and others, uh, there have been very few uh, political figures uh, that have been willing to do this. And that's, that's the real tragedy of it all. Uh, you know, I, I just hope that, um, you know, come uh, this new year that the progressives uh, push Joe Biden to the point where he's a different man. Because if we revert back to the Joe Biden of the 70s, 80s, 90s, and the early part of the 21st century before he became vice president, we're in for two years of a, of a disastrous uh, domestic policy and, um, and frankly, the probably the end of the Democratic Party as we know it. Because he, if he goes along with a get-along, uh, to-go-along approach and you know, compromise here and there to make uh, a few deals, then it's over. Uh, and that's a sad, sad thing for the country. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're going to probably end up with a re Republican uh, Donald Trump Jr., not him literally, but uh, people like him, you know, in 2024. So lots at stake. And, you know, it, it's so great to uh, to talk to you um, through these uh, years. And uh, this is our last show uh, on uh, Friday. So, uh, Mark, we really wish you a fantastic uh, uh, couple of weeks when we talk to you back, uh, I guess, around uh, January 6th or so, or January 8th, I think it is. Um, so we're uh, we're looking forward to that. Um, and uh, have yourself a safe next uh, uh, couple of um, of weeks, and uh, we'll talk soon. Jeff, it's always a pleasure working with you and Ron. You guys are top notch. You're the top of the field, and I really appreciate that. You have some the most intelligent, well spoken, educated guests I hear in the media. And that's really refreshing, especially as a journalist who's looking, who's looking for real information. So the best of, to you and your family and to Ron, his family, and all the people out there listening and all the folks that um, do such a great job of bringing these issues out on your show. And, yeah, I'm looking forward to a new year with a, a new start for everything. And I hope, hope you have a wonderful uh, holiday, Jeff. It's always great to talk with you.
Well, it's great to have you on, Mark, and uh, thank you for all you do. Uh, and and keep on fighting. I know there's uh, you have a lot on your plate, uh, a lot in your uh, personal world as well as uh, in your professional life. So uh, all the best, my friend. Prayers and thoughts go out with you and enjoy it. I know you will try to do so with your great music. Uh, thank you, my friend. Uh, always great uh, having you on. Um, I want to uh, I want to tell folks that uh, we have um, you know uh, a couple of days next week we'll be on folks and we'll be off probably either Wednesday or Thursday on uh, for a few days uh, of R and R and come back strong in 2021. Uh, that is uh, the plan right now. Things could change. Uh, maybe some announcements next week as well. Um, we'll get into that uh, too. Uh, I want to thank uh, uh, Ron Kreider for producing this broadcast. Thank you for listening, folks. Keep on fighting. My name is Jeff Santos. Have a great weekend. Right now, it's my time to say I...